on already? It is on, okay. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. It's Thursday, January 16th, 2020, and this is a special uh, meeting of the Board of Education for Bellbrook Sugar Creek Schools. This meeting is a meeting of the Board of Education in public for the purpose of conducting the school district's business and is not to be considered a public community meeting. Mr. Lyman, would you please call the roll? Mr. Carpenter? Here. Mrs. France? Mrs. Long, Here. Mr. Price is absent, and Mrs. Sloan. Here. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. directly on to uh, new business. Super, superintendent's report, um, new business report to the board. District legal counsel will provide information regarding district issues that are subject of uh, pending or imminent car court action. And we have Tabitha Justice here, one of our school attorney, attorneys from um, Sabashi, Wildermuth and Justice. So I'll turn it over to Tabitha Justice. Welcome. Thank you, board members, members of the community. Um, I'm terrible with using microphones, so let me know if I'm not loud enough or too loud or whatever it is. Unlike Dr. Kozad and the board members, I just don't have to use microphones all that often. Um, my name is Tabitha Justice, as Dr. Kozad said. I'm a partner at the law firm of Subashi, Wildermuth, and Justice. Nick Subashi and I are attorneys for the Board of Education. Um, due to limited technology restrictions here. My PowerPoint presentation is going to be run by me on two separate computers, so I'm going to have to tap one and then tap two. So have a little patience with me. I would appreciate it. So some of you may know me uh, these days by a more colorful name. Um, so I thought I would bring my friend here to add a little lightness to our conversation this evening. Um, it's funny, um, I've always been told that I have sort of um, an appropriate last name, so I never thought I was going to need an, a mascot like the Diagoropolo Man and Schultz folks, but here we are. So for those who care, um, this is also me. Um, I'm a U U.S. Army veteran, a 40 under 40 winner, um, winner of several community service awards, etc., etc. Sabashi, he was actually hired by the board as general counsel in 2007, as general counsel, excuse me, in 2007. Uh, long before that, uh, Nick su su successfully defended the Sugar Creek, Sugar Creek Board of Education at the time um, in an employment discrimination lawsuit as insurance defense counsel, and that's how he and Dr. St. Pierre uh, came to know one another. This evening, we're here to give the community a brief update on the various litigation matters pending in the district. The board recognizes that how the district spends taxpayer dollars is important to you. Unfortunately, litigation is not an optional expense that the board can just cut easily, especially when you get sued. 
rather than actually filing a lawsuit. When the board or one of its employees gets sued, the board is obligated to and, and required by law to defend itself and its employees. And while we do not usually give presentations such as this, um, an avalanche of litigation in this particular community is very unusual. Uh, the school district, since we've been representing them, them over the last 12 years, has seen very little litigation. And, it, and it's important, from my perspective, that the Board of Education have an opportunity to respond to one-sided and misleading publicity that has been generated by other individuals. In fact, today someone posted from Rule 3.6 of the Rules of Professional Conduct. So I'm going to be actually begin my presentation um, addressing that rule. And of, and of course, when you know it, I get a sniffly nose, right, when I have to present in front of a group of uh, the public. Um, so Rule 3.6 addresses trial publicity. It says a lawyer who is participating in or has participated in the investigation or litigation of a matter shall not make an extrajudicial statement that the lawyer knows or reasonably should know will be disseminated by means of public communication and will have a substantial likelihood of materially prejudicing, prejudicing ugh, an adjudicative proceeding in this matter. However, the rule specifically provides that it does not include information that is contained in a public record. It also provides that, notwithstanding this rule, a lawyer may make a statement that a reasonable lawyer would believe is required to protect a client from the substantial undue prejudicial effect of recent publicity not initiated by the lawyer or the lawyer's client. So we're going to be talking about three different matters today. The Supreme Court is one case. Um, obviously the Supreme Court, uh, that those judges are not going to care about what we talk about today. The OEC, or the Office of Election Commission, is another, or excuse me, the Ohio Elections Commission is another place that we're going to be talking about today. It's already said on public record that it doesn't care about publicity. And again, all of the information today that I will present is in the public record. Anyone can uh, pull up the trial pleadings and read anything that I'm saying today. In fact, I brought a number of those pleadings with me today if anyone would like copies of them. I cannot take questions um, because I'm obligated for, for reasons of the rule to only talk about things in the public record and I have to maintain attorney-client confidences and so I have to be very careful that I don't overstep that rule um, and so I'm sure everyone can understand that. So currently there are three litigation matters to which the board is responding. Keep in mind that there are, there are always regular uh, legal matters going on, on in a school district, like an employee who got hurt or a student discipline matter. But the three we're going to talk about today are not the sort of things that we typically see. The first case that we are going to talk about is the Betts records request you've all seen in the newspaper. Um, on August 4, 2019, 24-year-old Connor Betts killed nine people in the Oregon uh, district. He was a former student of Bellbrook, and the public clamored for information about him. Um, as you can see, that's just the very beginning of a Google search that we did. Um, and so you, you, know, you can imagine there's, there's hundreds of articles already that address this kid. Um, and so if fame was his goal, um, he got it. Uh, the news media discovered that Betts had a disciplinary record in the district from nine years earlier and made a request for his complete educational records. The law requires school districts to keep student records confidential. Uh, the confidentiality laws are actually written in a way that's very similar to, and, and just so you folks know, this is, I, I know I'm talking to the board, but it's very strange for me. I want to talk to all of you folks. And so um, I feel like this should be turned around the other way. Um, and so
so you might find that I actually do that occasionally, turn around and talk to you. So is, is, can everyone in the back hear me? Dane, can you hear? Good. Um, so, so the confidentiality laws are written very strictly. Uh, they're very much similar to um, HIPAA obligations for, for medical practitioners. The district denied the media's request for records for Connor Betts. Um, and this, frankly, was upon advice of legal counsel. The news media filed a lawsuit to get the records, arguing that student records are no longer confidential when the student dies. As, as we've stated to the court and the local uh, press, the Board of Education is not opposed to giving over this particular student's records if the law allows for the board to do that. Um, and as the board has advised the courts, the district is confident that it took appropriate action nine years ago. It's, it's a confident that it acted at all times in accordance with the safety and security of its students. And in fact, by not turning over the records, the district has actually put itself at a disadvantage because it can't respond to certain allegations that have been put in the public uh, uh, record that we know aren't true. Um, but, but we're stuck because these are confidential records and we have to maintain that confidentiality. The, the impact of, and the reason that it, it was a concern and the reason we fought it in this instance is that the impact of the records request went a lot further than just this one former student. If the board had to turn over Beth's records, it would have to turn over the records of all DC students, regardless of the impact on their parents, their spouses, or their children. On Monday of this week, an 18-year-old Miami Valley CTC student was shot and killed. In 2017, six kids committed suicide in, in Perry Township. Just one month after the Betts incident, one of the districts we represent, not Bellbrook, received a request from a TV station for the complete education file of a special needs girl who actually killed herself. This was not, this was not the parents making the request for this information. This was not children's services or law enforcement, but the news um, wanting to divulge all of the information about the student to the public. After brief, briefing by the news media and the district in the Betts matter, all three judges of the Second District Court of Appeals agreed with the school district that Betts records should not be produced. This was not a, well, we sort of think that the Board of Education um, shouldn't give these records over this was a very clear and unequivocal statement that the Board of Education by law couldn't until the legislator, legis, ugh, legislator changed the law. That's what they told us. The news organizations have filed an appeal. Oh, I'm so sorry. The, um, they filed an appeal to the Ohio Supreme Court. The matter's been briefed at least. Um, they filed their initial brief and we have filed our reply brief or our response brief. They get another chance to file a reply. Um, and then of course it will be argued publicly. Uh, one last point on this particular case, the Dayton Daily News and some members of the public have commented recently on the fact that the, that the Attorney General's office has filed a brief in this case. They reported this as if this was a new development, set, suggesting essentially that the school district was wrong. But the AG's office has already filed a brief in the original court case. The court actually considered the AG's arguments and still found in favor of the school district. The court explained in its decision how the AG had actually done a flip-flop on whether confidential records should be protected after death. The 
The second case that we're going to talk about is Stafford versus Citizens of Bellbrook. On September 11, 2019, a local resident named John Stafford filed a complaint with the Ohio Elections Commission. The complaint was against the treasurer of the Political Action Committee, or PAC, that supported the district's efforts to pass a levy in May of 2019. He also named the district superintendent, Dr. Kozad, in his complaint. And that ultimately is why we ended up having to defend it. The complaint alleges that the PAC failed to report in-kind contributions to the Elections Commission as required by Ohio law. Every count in the complaint accuses the Board of Education and its employees of using public funds to support the, ta the PAC. <coughs> Stafford specifically refers in his complaint to a similar complaint that had been filed against him and the Election Commission by local citizens. He suggests in his filing that the complaint against him is part of the basis of his complaint against the school district. The allegations in that complaint, we, we summarized them up here. Now, to be fair to myself, um, my PowerPoint actually has these numbered correctly, if anyone wants to see. Um, uh, so on this district's version, though, they're not numbered correctly. Um, but essentially, he alleges that the PAC used the district's bulk mail permit for sending mail. He alleges that the board sent two postcards regarding the levy. He alleges that the board sent a newsletter with information about the levy. He alleges that the PAC used district facilities for campaign activities and that employees worked on PAC matters during school hours and that district employees use district email to conduct PAC activities. We, re we prepared a response to those allegations. Um, and I, again, I've brought copies to, of our response, if anyone would like a copy of that response. Ohio law actually puts school boards and their administrators in a difficult position, as you folks all know. It requires them to go to the public to ask for levy funds, but another law places limitations on what a school board can actually say um, in regards to their request for levy funds. Because of this odd feature of the law, it's sometimes hard to balance what is permitted to, to be done and what is, what is not permitted to be done. Here, the burden to seek levy support is higher uh, than in other districts because only 27% of the district's budget comes from the state compared to the state average of 44%. As a consequence of the competing laws, political action committees are formed by citizens who support the school district, but those PACs are necessarily dependent upon information held by the Board of Education. The, it's only the treasurer who's going to have the most accurate information about the district's finances. Under Ohio law, school districts may publish materials to further public awareness of all aspects of the Board's educational program and operation. This includes district finances. The Attorney General has stated that schools are permitted to use public dollars on materials discussing the consequences that are expected to follow from the passage or defeat of a particular tax levy. However, school districts cannot specifically attempt to persuade people to vote a particular way on a tax levy. That is to say, they cannot say, vote yes on issue X. School districts are always struggling with the balance between information and advocacy. These are examples of how odd this area of the law is. A school district could print signs like the one on the left where it encourages people to vote but does not say vote yes or vote no. A school district would not be permitted to print signs like the one on the right. Returning to the, the litigation at hand um, in the Ohio Elections Commission, first we have to keep in mind that it is a complaint to the Ohio Elections Commission, which is concerned about reporting in-kind contributions. Um, this is not a complaint to the state auditor. The only question for the Ohio Elections Commission is whether the district spent money to support 
the PAC, the Political Action Committee, which if they did that, then that, the PAC had to report those contributions as in kind. The question before the Elections Commission, um, whether the message, excuse me, whether the message uh, of what, I'm sorry, again, I think I have my uh, PowerPoint presentation, it's not caught up with one another. Um, there we go. This knocks out the claims related to postcards and newsletters uh, pretty easily. Um, those materials include the district's message about its own levy, whether the message is consistent with the message of the PAC. Other pro-district groups are not. There's no mention of the PAC or any activities of the PAC. So, so then let's go to the very first allegation. Um, Stafford alleged that the PAC used the district's bulk mail permit for sending mail. This allegation is false. Um, the, the board's bulk mailing permit is permit number 620. You will not find the Board of Education's bulk mailing permit number on a single PAC mailing. On January 31, 2019, the PAC did, in fact, use a conference room within a board building, uh, the St. Pierre, Saint Pierre uh, Education Center, to conduct an organizational meeting. This was the only meeting of the PAC on board premises. It lasted no more than one and a half hours. Board policy specifically provides for the use of district premises to citizen groups with prior permission. Girl Scouts, church groups, club teams, etc. Ohio law does not actually detail how the use of facilities should be reported. They don't talk, they don't give you any details about reporting the use of corporate property. The Federal Election Commission regulations, however, establish specifically a four hour per month safe harbor for the use of corporate facilities by corporate employees for their individual volunteer activities in connection with an election. If the employee uses the facility for less than four hours per month, it does not need to be reported, even if the cost, of, it, it, even if it increases the overhead cost of that entity. Here, the conference room was used well less than four hours, but more importantly, the building was open anyway. So there was no cost to the district whatsoever for the PAC committee members to walk in there, sit down, talk for an hour and a half, and then leave. In short, there was no in-kind contribution to report. So then we move to the next allegation. Employees worked on PAC matters during school hours. From our initial hearing with the Ohio Elections Commission, it is clear that this is the allegation that the OEC was the most concerned about. And these days, school attorneys such as myself, when we're asked, and that's when we're asked, will usually recommend that no school employee do any PAC activities during school hours. It's not because the law requires that. It is to avoid the appearance of overlap or to avoid the exact sort of situation that we're in right now. And it also does not mean that district employees can't use district time to prepare levy materials. Because providing information about the levy is their job. Dr. Kozad had, Dr. Kozad and Kevin Limey had to prepare the actual resolutions and materials for the board to vote upon. That's their job. And so it only means that school employees should avoid PAC activities during school hours and over promotion of a levy. So, so what are we talking about um, with respect to employees working on PAC matters during school hours? So what's been alleged essentially 
is uh, in the complaint, Stafford has pointed to five emails that would have taken, in my view, uh, and, and I promise not to give you my view, so the, the uh, Stafford has pointed to five emails that would not have taken much time to prepare. They could have sent those emails on their breaks or lunches, um, and there's no indication in the public record that anyone ever asked these employees, hey, you know, were you on a break when you sent this email before filing this complaint? The Federal Election Commission has stated that corporate employee may engage in political activities during work for no more than one hour per week or four hours per month without having to report it as an in-kind contribution. Staff has not alleged in his complaint or presented any evidence that any of these individuals spent more than an hour a week working on PAC activities. Not even close. The other problem that we put in our response, again, we have copies of the response up here, is that these employees are all exempt employees. That means they do not have set hours. By law, they do not have set hours. If Kevin Liming comes to work for five hours a day, um, because he has to go pick up his kids, and I'm just making that up because I don't even know if you have any kids, you know, I'm just saying. Um, but if he has to do that, he's allowed to do that because he does not clock in and out. He is an exempt employee. These employees all perform work on behalf of the school district that requires irregular hours. We all know that. They attend school functions after hours. Coaches over there. They, got, they re respond to emergencies. They check for snow on the roads at four in the morning. They come to these never ending board meetings. These are just some examples of things that they do after eight to three. Exempt employees are required to get a certain amount of work done regardless of whether or not they get it done during school hours. If they have to come in on Saturday, they come in on Saturday. They do not keep track of their hours and they do not get overtime. The bulk of Stafford's complaint to the OEC relates to Dr. Doug Posad. The 2018 and 2019 the 2018-2019 school year was Dr. Kozad's first year as superintendent. Dr. Kozad learned that the district faced an imminent financial crisis only months after he was hired. When the board decided to place a levy on the ballot, Dr. Kozad was responsible for nav navigating that, those circumstances. He relied heavily upon the past practice of the district. We've seen a lot of communications uh, posted on the internet, uh, supposedly from Dr. Kozad, related to the PAC but they are almost all after school hours and on the weekend. Like other parents in the district, Dr. Kozad put a lot of his personal time and effort into trying to get the levy passed, just as the First Amendment allows him to do. The final allegation, um, and, and I like this one, the, the district employees use district email to conduct PAC activities. <coughs> Historically, in every district, levy committees will be comprised of administrators, teachers, um, employees, community mem members, as many people as possible to get a levy passed. For better or worse, sometimes committee members use their district email addresses as their contact information. Um, it's not the best practice because then someone might argue they were just using district resources for the levy. And then we end up here. So what resources are we actually talking about? From January 1, 2019 to March 7, 2019, that's three months, three months, um, and actually, I think that it's to May 7th, 2019, excuse me. The district sent, five months, I guess. Uh, the district sent or received, anyone want to take a guess? We want to do like one of those jar pin number things? How many emails were sent in the district during those five months? Really close. Two million, one hundred thousand me emails sent during those five months. Two million, one hundred thousand emails. Um, of those, 
I think that Stafford in his complaint pointed to five or six. Anyone want to take a guess at how much the board pays for each email sent in the district? Yeah. So the district uses Google for email, which is free. The only possible charge to the district is for internet service. Of course, the district must have inter internet service anyway to operate regardless of emails. Assuming for sake of argument that we had to calculate how much the emails sent between PAC members cost the district in data, the best estimate would be approximately one one thousandth of a cent. So one thousand emails like those the ones that Stafford has pointed to in this complaint would cost the district a single penny. In addition, the district pays for its data regardless of whether or not two million emails are sent or one email is sent. Again, no in-kind contribution for the PAC-2 report. <clears throat> so, uh, some of you are probably wondering what is going to come of the complaint. Um, at the worst case scenario in the Elections Commission is essentially a fine, um, usually ranging from $100 to $500 for technical reporting violations by the PAC treasurer. Um, they will find, make a finding against the PAC treasurer um, and essentially tell them to do a better job reporting finances, but the treasurer's already resigned as a result of this litigation, so that's a non-issue. The hearing officer has already recommended that the specific count against Dr. Kozad be dismissed. Still, it appears that this litigation will continue until a ruling is actually issued or the case is dismissed. The third lit lawsuit or litigation that we want to talk about today is the case of Stafford versus Carpenter. On September 19, 2019, uh, the same Mr. Stafford filed a lawsuit against the Board of Education and its members alleging violations of Ohio's Open Meetings Act. The purpose of the Open Meetings Act is to ensure that board discussions about most things that the Board of Education will vote about will be discussed in public. There are several exceptions that allow a board to talk about some things in executive session. So what are his specific allegations? And I tried to, the, the complaint is very, very long. Um, and so I tried to break it down as succinctly as I could. Um, essentially, he alleges that board members conducted secret meetings to discuss how to respond to public criticism related to the levy, and that board members improperly went into executive session on these dates. Stafford's complaint focuses on initially on a discussion amongst board members that begins with a text message from Virginia Slothman that says, bulletin boards seem to summarize that people are questioning the need for the levy, the already high taxes, and urging others not to vote for it. Confusion from one of the news agencies that identified the levy as a new tax rather than a replacement. She does not attack anyone or express any opinion. She simply provides information about what she has seen to her fellow board members. And these are all attachments to the complaint. So they're all public avail publicly available. Uh, the next email he talks about is, uh, you, you can actually see that the board members are actually gathering information so that they can best respond um, to questions from the public about the levy. The vast majority of the emails relied upon by staff are emails in which board members are providing information, seeking information, or trying to figure out how to provide more information to the community about the levy. There were no personal attacks from any board member. There was no oh my God, we have to stop people from criticizing the board. There was nothing like that. In response to information that the district was providing to the public about the levy, again, this was attached to his complaint, Stafford stated, they are like the fatted hogs at the trough, getting fat on taxpayers' money, and they think it will never end. These are board members who are paid $125 a meeting. 
these fun, fun meetings. Despite this attack, board members left the negativity in the superintendent's hands and focused on the facts and information that the community was requesting about the levy, as demonstrated by the attachments in the complaint. An email attached to his complaint, another, excuse me, this is another email attached to his complaint showing efforts by board members to respond to community member questions. <clears throat> this is an email uh, from Kathy Kingston. This uh, Stafford's primary allegation related to the secret meetings is that the board talked about writing a letter explaining why they decided to put the levy on the ballot. This is one of those secret communications. Um, in this specific text message from Kathy, she tells the board members she would like to write a letter to the community about why we decided to put it on the ballot. She's been asked to do a first draft um, and ask for uh, any information that the other board members can provide. Stafford has portrayed these board member communications as secret meetings to respond to public criticism. According to his complaint, he believes such actions are similar to a case out of Cincinnati where council members got in trouble for using text and emails. The board has responded with an answer to the complaint that addresses um, the problems with this particular portrayal. And again, I have copies of that particular pleading, and again, my information today comes from directly from the pleadings and directly from our response. And if anyone would like a copy, uh, again, we have that. have concluded that information gathering by a Board of Education does not need to occur in a public meeting. Every question they might have from the treasurer or the superintendent does not have to happen in a public meeting. Courts have concluded that board members are permitted to provide information to the public about levies. Here it is very clear that the board member communications were directed to responding to misinformation about the district's need for a levy. The postcards sent by the Board of Education do not address criticism or criticize Stafford or anyone else. They provide information. In addition, the Board had already voted to place the levy on the ballot. Any decision making had already taken place. Open meetings laws require discussions leading up to a vote to occur in public. In his complaint, Stafford tries to say that the board later voted to ratify the information that was placed in their postcards. Again, he analogizes this case to the Cincinnati council member case where the council members voted to ratify a public statement that they made. Except that this never happened in Bellbrook. There's no vote whatsoever ever took place from any of the text messages or emails that he attached to his complaint. Therefore, there would be nothing for the court to invalidate under an Open Meetings Act lawsuit. Stafford also complains that Carpenter, Kingston, and France were invited to join a private Facebook group called We Support the Bellbrook School Levy sometime before the May 7, 2019 election. He claims that was a, this was a quorum of board members and it should have been required to follow the Open Meetings Act. That means that they would have to give notice of any communications, they would have to put this in the news, they would have to do agenda, they would have to do minutes, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, it's unclear as to whether, if it's unclear from the complaint as to whether Stafford also thinks that if three board members join five seasons or go to the same church, that they also need to follow the Open Meetings Act. No court has ever concluded that liking or following a Facebook group consisting of more than 70 private citizens is a meeting of the Board of Education that must follow the requirements of the Open Meetings Act. Stafford has not presented any evidence in his complaint of any communications by board members in this group. 
He has not just demonstrated that three board members communicated or even read comments or posts in this group. For all we know from his complaint, a board member could have clicked accept invitation and never even looked at the page or looked at it only once. Certainly there's no evidence presented in the complaint that a quorum of board members was having discussions in the group about things upon which they would later be called upon to vote. The rest of Stafford's open meeting act complaint relates to the board not using the specific language required by that statute. Um, uh, the statute is, uh, and I apologize again, Uh, is covered up by one. So um, actually what's underneath this right here is statute 121-22, um, which is the Revised Code Open Meetings Act. It deals with executive exception for executive sessions. So Stafford's Open Meetings Act complaint says that essentially the board did not use the appropriate language um, and did not go into executive session appropriately. In, in my world, uh, as you can see, we call these technicalities. Um, I'll, I will go through some of the allegations so you can see what I mean. On this disc is the law in Ohio interpreting the executive session exception. I was going to print it and bring it in, and why you see this here, I'm just going to print it and bring it in and so you folks could understand just how difficult the executive session exception is uh, to interpret even for attorneys and courts. Um, but when I got it downloaded, it was 5,031 pages. I'm not carrying that in here. Um, I'm not aware of any attorney who has a 100% track record on interpreting the statute. Um, judges regularly disagree and get overturned on appeal. Um, Lauren, another attorney uh, from the area, she can attest to that. The, the executive session uh, uh, statute is, it has a lot of case law. Um, yet somehow, somehow we expect as a community for board members, um, most of them who usually have no legal experience whatsoever, they're supposed to get this right every time. We as attorneys can't get it right every time, but these, these guys are supposed to. So, again, mine is pretty. <laughs> this one, not so much. Um, so, executive sessions, uh, Stafford does not let allege in his particular lawsuit that he lost his job or that uh, his property was taken or that his child was suspended. Um, typically, when we get an executive session lawsuit, um, that's what we see. Typically an executive session lawsuit is filed because a person was fired and the board did not give them sufficient notice that they were going to be fired. They didn't follow the specific language of the executive session statute uh, exception and so that individual was specifically damaged and harmed. So Stafford, in his first allegation regarding executive session, he alleges that the board improperly went into executive session to discuss superintendent's goals. Oh, here's the statute for it. So, so I, this is, the statute provides that the Board of Education, I'll just turn, may go into executive session to consider the appointment, employment, dismissal, discipline, promotion, demotion or compensation of a public employee or official, or the investigation of charges or complaints against a public employee. If the public body holds an executive session pursuant to the statute, they should say that that's what they're going to do, right? And, that they, and you'll see it actually says, interestingly enough, shall state which one or more of the approved purposes listed in the section are the purposes that the executive session is to be held for. Of course, what we litigate constantly as attorneys is what does employment, dismissal, discipline, all of these words, what does that actually mean? And do these actual specific words need to be in the notice that the Board of Education gives? And you'll note, 
that it specifically says that the board does not need to include the name of the employee that they're actually considering action against or for or whatever. So they don't even have to include the name. They just have to use employment, dismissal, discipline, promotion, demotion, or compensation. So now what boards of education do, um, you know, contrary to the way it used to be done, um, is they say exactly those words. Um, and, and they use just exactly those words. And as you can see, when the board went into executive session to discuss superintendent's goals, even though it might fall under this other language, superintendent's goals was not used. And so Mr. Stafford alleges that that was a violation of the, the statute. And so what we did in response in our answer is we said, that's fine, judge, that's okay. We, in the future, we will use the specific language from the statute. You're right, we didn't, superintendent's goals is not the specific language of the statute. And so we said, fine, going forward, we'll do that. You know why? There's really no reason for the Board of Education to litigate over that issue, right? They're happy to just use the specific language out of the statute. So, so that's what the Open Meetings Act actually allows for, right? They, it allows for the court to tell the Board of Education, do it this way, follow this rule. That's what the statute says. So we also did the same, so I showed you the superintendent's goals um, one of, two of the other allegations are that the board went into executive session to discuss superintendent evaluation and to discuss the treasurer's evaluation. Even though this fall under employment compensation, all of these other things, we did not use the specific magic language. Um, and so we said, Judge, if you want us to use the specific magic language going forward, we'll use the specific magic language going forward. The board did not admit to some of the allegations or the alleged technical violations because we think that, frankly, we think that the Stafford has the law wrong on those. Um, and so, for instance, he complains that the board used the word discuss instead of consider. Um, and so, ultimately, we'll, the court will have to figure out whether or not the two of them are so different that the, the board somehow violated the executive session exceptions to the open meetings law. Sometimes it's difficult to know whether or not a particular court will be as particular about the words. Um, some courts are particular and some courts aren't. And so maybe the court will tell us to use those specific words and, and we'll find that out. So let's just talk a little bit then um, as we get closer to the end, um, about what could happen if Stafford were to win all of his claims in the Greene County Court of Common Pleas. And again, that's the Open Meetings Act case. Um, the court would issue an order to the board telling it to use better language in the future. You know, don't do that again. Um, the board will then have, uh, essentially the Board of Education at that point, of course, is going to run every single executive session agenda to me. Um, it's going to cost the district more money um, instead of just uh, you know relying upon past practice. Um, the board will have to pay a civil forfeiture of five hundred dollars plus court costs. In addition, and, and this is really the what I was saying earlier about with respect to employment actions. This is actually what the Open Meetings Act. Um, uh, the big, the big thing that happens in the Open Meetings Act case is, if they find in Stafford's favor, it actually invalidates any action that the board took as a consequence of the the adverse or the the, the improper executive session. But the problem in this case is there weren't any. There there were no board actions that arose out of these, with exception of one um, executive session at the end of the year which was the May, uh, actually two, Kevin Lyman actually got a new contract ultimately, and then at the end of the year, the board took action as to almost every employee in the district. Um, and so arguably the court could invalidate that last meeting and say that that, uh, and essentially negate all that resolution. But it really doesn't make any difference because even if the court does that, there's a, another statute 
that kicks into play, saying all of those contracts roll over anyway. They all roll over anyway. Kevin gets another contract. The other administrators get another contract. The chief gets another contract. They roll over by virtue of a statute. Um, so even if that those those sessions are invalidated, it doesn't ha actually have an impact on the school district. Now, so, so again, Stafford could actually try to say that his goal was to get those employment contracts invalidated, but it doesn't work that way. So, what is the only other possible remedy? Oh, probably wondering what five is. publicly that he has over $100,000 in attorney fees. He has stated publicly that he anticipates that the Board of Education has spent over $100,000 in attorney fees. In the Election Commission matter, Stafford has subpoenaed the Board of Education to do yet another search of its records um, for emails related to more than four dozen people. Um, he says threatened to take the depositions of at least a dozen people, including me, and he's going to post them on the internet. Um, long story short, given what we've seen so far, the, we do not anticipate that this litigation is going to end anytime soon. And I anticipate that I'll probably be back here um, in a bit to just give you an update again. Um, and so, you know, I appreciate everyone's time and patience um, and, and listening to me despite the, the technical glitches and whatnot. Thank you very much. very much. Thank you very much. And um, thank you for your service to our country as well. Board members, do you have any comments? Anyone? All right, do we have a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of considering charges or complaints against a public employee or official and consider the discipline of a public employee or official pursuant to RC 121.22, paragraph G1, no action will be taken. Motion? Mrs. France? Mrs. Slothman? Please call the roll. Mrs. France? Yes. Motion passes. We will now go into executive session. Thank you all very much for coming this evening.